I feel like you need to change your background from your truck because that's just too like. <laughs> no, you know? I I am a truck now. No, I exist as your, a truck. This is your truck free zone. This is the zombie zone, not the trucker zone. Got to get rid of the truck background. Change to the explosions. I I feel like the truck just it Underscore. takes over. It yeah. takes over my life, it's... and now now I'm just like I'm. I'm I'm parked for the weekend as a person. I am parked and I'm just waiting to be started back up on Monday. Well, I hate to break it to you, but I Welcome to the Zombie Book Club, the only book club where sometimes the book is a movie, but the movie isn't necessarily a book of in any meaningful way. And Brad Pitt gets one scene to eat pancakes in. Oh. Did you know that uh in every movie Brad Pitt eats something? It's it's like the thing that he he does that like he looks cool doing. So like Tom Cruise runs in every movie, Tom Hanks really? pees in every movie, even Captain Phillips, there's like a whole thing about him not being able to pee. And he goes out and tries to pee so many times. And Brad Pitt eats at least in one scene and directors have tried to stop him from eating and he will hide food in the scene. And when the cameras start rolling, he'll just start putting food in his mouth and they're just like, fine, just let him eat, I guess. <laughs> it's wild. Hi, Leah. Hi, did you hear that horrifying beeping sound? I didn't. Okay, hopefully I didn't record because I accidentally set a timer instead of a stopwatch <laughs> while you were talking. <laughs> so if there is some horrifying beeping, I'm sorry. I'll you're on your rant about uh, Tom, or not Tom Cruise, Brad Pitt eating. Yeah. I've never noticed this about Brad Pitt. I really, the first thing I noticed about Brad Pitt was in Legends of the Fall when he was, had very long, luxurious hair. Uh mm. I don't really notice the eating part, but I believe no. you. Now you're never going to be able to unsee it. Um, no, hi, I'm Dan. I'm a writer and I'm uh, writing a book based on the zombie apocalypse. And here we are with a zombie podcast talking about, about books that have been written <laughs> in the zombie apocalypse. Yeah. And actors who eat pancakes. And I'm mm -hmm. Leah. And my sole purpose in life is to advance the storyline of this podcast while not having any personality or character traits because I have a vulva. And that's what people with vulvas do in pretty much every zombie film. They're just yeah. there as fillers uh, or as people to save. So, yeah, that's that's how I wrote you. Again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, welcome, everybody. To, this is a special episode. This is episode 10. Yay. Uh, I mean, I assume it is. We don't know until it goes up, but I assume this is episode 10. <laughs> <laughs> and we've we've made it a rule that every five episodes... Uh, it's it's this is the this is the book club part of the podcast where we pick a book that we all agreed it we all agreed to read it Leah every Listen. one of us everybody listening <laughs> everybody did <laughs> <laughs> uh, in the in this in this episode it's World War Z um, a uh, a book that almost anybody knows like if you say I read zombie books most people will be like ah, I've never read a zombie book except for World War Z. That's me. <laughs> I, I qualify as that. I only read World War Z. Although I do think I read Max Brooks. Um, what is it? Survival Guide? Yeah, Zombie Survival Guide. Casually. I don't think I read the whole thing. I get yeah. flipped by a few times. I went cover to cover. Yeah, but we've had 10 episodes, um, or this will be our 10th episode, presuming it goes out um, before an apocalypse actually happens. And yeah, we've had people coming. listening literally from all over the world now, which is kind of wild. So just want to say hello to our UK contingent. There's a lot of you. Yeah. Um. Somebody from Singapore is apparently listening. So hi. Yeah. There's a few other countries in there too. Uh, I noticed there's at least one person from Greece listening. And little known fact, I was born in Greece. Uh, my dad was in the Navy and uh, I was born in Athens at the Matera hospital, which is a, uh, a hospital for moms having babies, I guess. Uh, it doesn't exist anymore, and neither does my birth certificate. <laughs> or your dad. Or my dad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's gone. Missing. Uh, he's not dead. I just, I mean, he might be. <laughs> we don't know. <laughs> uh, I, I also, li uh, we lived in a town called Neomachery, which is just outside of Athens. Yeah. Um, so if you know where that is, one person from Greece, let me let me know if you've been to Neomachery. Tell me uh, how my house is doing. <laughs> Do you remember your house in Greece? A little bit. I just, I mean, I remember it being like, like dimly lit inside. Mm. Um, that's about it. 
I, that's uh, not very much, but you were like two. So fun, fun story. My dad fell asleep um, while watching me one afternoon. Probably he was probably tired as as dads are. <laughs> and um, I uh, I remember I, uh, I I guess I woke him up and he got mad at me. So I decided to climb onto the roof. <laughs> and um, I mean, the houses there all the roofs were flat so there'd be like a little like patio area on the roof that people would hang out i guess i just wanted to hang out on the patio so i climbed up a ladder on the side of the house wow dan and um got onto the roof and then my mom came home and uh saw me on the roof all by myself <laughs> were you do you remember this or is this a story you've been told i've i've been told this i don't remember it okay okay <laughs> i wonder um... if that's why my parents got divorced <laughs> Could be one of many reasons. Yeah, I think I'd be pretty mad if my child is on the roof at like two. Yeah. Um, but we also have people tuning in from Texas. A lot of people from Texas. But Dan, you have a theory about about this. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, uh, so on on Instagram, uh, briefly talked to somebody who's uh, also a truck driver listening to our podcast. Um, not only a truck driver, but a truck driver writer listening to our truck driver writer podcast. <laughs> Uh, I think it's, I think all of the Texas listens are just him driving around Texas. Uh, so yeah, let me know if know. you were is in Texas theory? listening to our podcast. <laughs> <laughs> is that correct? Yeah. But yeah, we've had also, a lot of writers. What, what is it about truck driver? Like, is, is this a common thread with truck drivers? I feel like I haven't met too many that like got the writing bug, but like, um, when you're doing over the road truck driving and like, you're kind of alone a lot, like I, I it's kind of like a perfect opportunity to get some writing done sometimes. And lots of times I just think, like, I think that's part of why you like, well, I don't know if you like being a truck driver, but part one of the perks <laughs> of being a truck driver <laughs> for you is time to think. So we did want to give a shout out to the writers, the truck drivers, the truck driver writers who we know are are listening. Hello. Yeah. Hope you're doing Life okay update, there. Leah. You know, um, Dan, I'd I like to point news. out that you love to interrupt me. Yeah, on this I do. Podcast. I love interrupting This is also you. very uh, cis hetero male behavior. You know that in the last episode... I edited, it. I edited, edited the episode mm -hmm. so that I interrupted you during a time that I didn't originally interrupt you. Are you serious? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Trying oh, to find well, it. <laughs> I guess I'm going to just, you know, uh, go back to my role of being um, a one dimensional yeah. character here. So continue. What were you going to say, Dan? Yeah. Well, this is how you were written. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> yeah. I'm an actual sentient being here. Yeah um life update leah uh mm -hmm. bad news i have terrible news for you leah uh, what's that we broke our hammock i was there for that that was terrible <laughs> <laughs> it's very sad yeah i mean I, it probably needed to be on level ground and our yard is anything but level it is it is a mountain our house is yeah. a mountain yeah and um yeah i guess it's just too much pressure in one direction and the whole thing just kind of folded over on us when i got into it um, I think it's my fault. I'm, I'm pushing <laughs> I mean, real I close on to the weight came. limit of that <laughs> hammock just by myself. I don't think us putting it on the side of a hill the way we did was a good idea. But yeah. rest in peace, hammock frame. We've already replaced you thanks to Amazon. So we've got some more hammocks coming. But that is it is very devastating because my favorite thing to do in the springtime or really when it's not winter and even when it's winter sometimes is hanging out in the hammock. Yeah. So, but you know what? That yeah. uh, That hammock was not ready for the zombie apocalypse no it also creaked a lot so like it wasn't yeah. safe from a sound uh sound point of view either zombies would definitely hear it but on yeah. the flip side i mean that was a devastating moment when our hammock broke but i am happy to report to the listeners who may have cared about whether or not my toe was actually broken from dan's uh safety first placement of rifles that's very my... irresponsible of you leah to not <laughs> my go toe my is... gun like that <laughs> <laughs> my toe is not broken and the gun is in a safe place Dan already forgot where the safe place was. I had to tell him and I will not say it on air, <laughs> but it is now in a safe place and my toe is not broken. It just hurt really badly. Yeah. So um, I might've been being slightly melodramatic. You know, speaking of um, how much I am tired and uh, just, I'm just generally despondent about being back to work, doing paving. And I drive, I drive what's called a flow boy. It's a semi truck dump truck kind of situation. Um, it has like a conveyor belt in the trailer and uh, you fill up the trailer with all kinds of shit and the conveyor belt uh, rolls it out the back. So we're paving um, and it's, 
it's tiring. It's hot. The hours are long. I'm I'm out on the road sometimes 14 hours a day, and then I come home and I'm dead. <laughs> and uh, but one thing that I'm working on is uh, I've I've wanted for a very long time now to grow mushrooms as a business. Mm-hmm. If, uh, if 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 any of you have looked into things like that, uh, you know, what? secret handshake. Show me the secret mushroom handshake. <laughs> and not that one <laughs> you know the one. Oh, i did not even go uh, but yeah you know work's killing me slowly and um i feel like transitioning to starting a business where i grow and sell mushrooms it's like it's it goes along with my life a lot better and yeah. i think it'll help me live longer <laughs> um yeah that's that's all i got for that yeah, we'll get back to it. We're working on a business plan and uh, it does include cordyceps, folks, for the Last of Us fans. We want to know, Last of Us fans, will you eat Dan's cordyceps after watching that show? We're curious. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. Also, uh, right before this, I, you know, because of the Last of Us, you know, I've been a little bit miffed about the whole uh, Myco world and like not really knowing how that's going to affect my dreams of selling mushrooms. Turns out everybody's fear of cordyceps has actually boosted sales of cordyceps. Really? Yeah. There's like, it's oh, a huge news. boom right now and I need to get on it. <laughs> I don't know what that's, I don't know what that says about humanity, but yeah, you've got to perfect your cordyceps yeah. growing um, process, but we'll get there. And my little last bit of news is that I um, accidentally told my coworkers about this podcast <laughs> <laughs> uh didn't mean to do that i we were doing this icebreaker we had a, a work retreat and we were doing an icebreaker where you had to like write something nobody knows about you on a piece of paper and last year we did the same exact icebreaker but that time they just had people read them aloud and you didn't know whose was whose but this time they actually had you figure it out um and it turns out that one of my coworkers is actually who found it is a zombie fan so shout out to you i'm not going to say your name in case you also don't want to be called out for loving zombies but then decided to tell the entire organization that i have a zombie <laughs> apocalypse podcast and then like everybody was like what is it what's it called and i said i'm not telling you because it's not safe for work and if you did somehow find it co-workers just don't listen to the amazon hundred dollar challenge okay that's my request to you you <laughs> you'll never be able to look me in the eye again uh and i won't be able to look at you either so just don't yeah um and also if you're listening to this and you know who leah's co-workers are don't Tell her co-workers to listen to the no. Amazon challenge. <laughs> <laughs> no, please. Don't. Um, so for this episode, Leah, we're mm -hmm. we're doing um uh um World War Z. I had to look at the title. World <laughs> War Z. Much, that's how much ADHD I've got going on. Is I'm like, what's the name of the thing we're doing right now? <laughs> the thing the that I've been one talking of the most about for weeks, ever. trying to sort this out. Uh. So we're doing both the movie and the book. And we figured we'd start with the movie. Um, yes. Because most of you probably watched the movie. And yeah. I'm very curious how many of you actually have read the book. You know, I know many of you who are listening right now. And I know you. I know you. You watched the movie. <laughs> <laughs> hey, no shame in the movie watching. Yeah. No shame. <laughs> but you know what? Um Actually, I'm I'm hoping that this might convince a few people to read the book, uh, because here's the thing: the book and the movie are entirely different things. Completely different. Yeah. Um, so the movie, it's uh, I would say that this is like an action thriller movie. Yeah. Um, and it's about Brad Pitt eating pancakes with his cute little family that he has to save. Yep. And then, uh, then zombies happen. Um. I do appreciate that they don't explain why zombies happen. They just happen. They happened very rapidly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, and then uh, first act, you know, uh, they escape Philadelphia. They go to Newark for some reason. Um, and then they are picked up by the UN. They live on a, they go, they go to a, a boat and then Brad Pitt has to go around the world trying to figure out, where the zombies originated from in an effort to figure out a way to stop the zombie virus. Yeah. So he goes to Korea, yeah. South Korea. He goes to Korea. Israel. He goes to Israel. Um, and then he goes to Wales. My homeland. It's, yeah. It's just, it's a, you know, what? it's a road trip movie. 
So like if you've ever seen <laughs> Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, yeah, it's basically yeah. the same movie. <laughs> Just with super fast zombies chasing you and smashing their heads through windshields. Yeah. So yeah, and that's another difference between the book and the movie is that the uh, the movie has highly motivated zombies. I call them highly motivated, but they're fast. Uh, they smash their heads through uh, windshields. Um, they uh, they can climb up walls. Uh, they can do all kinds of crazy things. Um, and also they make really weird noises, like yeah, like uh, like dinosaurs. <laughs> they clack their teeth. Yeah. Um, also. Something that I never really thought about until we were watching it this last time is that these zombies tend to seem to have like a hive mind. Um, That's what I pointed out during the the scene where they climb the wall together. Oh, they yeah, like I climb didn't... on top of each other. Yeah, I guess they would have to have like they're like ants. That's what it looked like. I mean, I think if for those who have not watched it, I'm assuming you are listening because you don't care about being having spoilers, which are going to happen always in this show. Oh yeah, spoiler alert. Um, so Israel <laughs> figures out how to build a wall uh they realize that this is going to happen so they build these ridiculously high walls nothing to do with the jewish palestinian conflict nothing at all just zombies um which yeah. i feel is weird they don't even talk touch on that but anyhow also the they the the um, the israeli person claims they're just letting everybody in i'm assuming yeah, that means also, also palestinians that. so uh yeah there's a lot about there's a lot of problematic stuff <laughs> in this movie <laughs> But anyways, the wall is exceedingly high. Like, I don't know, four or five stories tall. Yeah, tall. it's pretty tall. And it's thick. And of course, the people on the inside of the wall decide to sing on loudspeakers to celebrate um, their survival. And the zombies, like, create a, a ladder by climbing, like, piling up on top of each other so that they can get over. It's weird. Yeah. Never seen any zombies do that before. I mean, I you could, I, I guess you could do it without them having, like, a hive mind um, if they were just following the sound um they might just be charging towards it and they're just they're just running up corpses at that point like all the zombies on the bottom they're they're dead they're crushed right that does require some form of intelligence though because you think they would just the the sound was diffuse it wasn't like from one spot and it became this weird like pointed ladder thing instead of them all just trying to get over the wall i don't know yeah i'm voting hive mind yeah um also uh when they when they go to wales there's a um like a research facility that uh brad pitt goes to (laughs) <laughs> and uh and they tell him uh before he goes in to where to the side of the hospital where the zombies are they're like try not to kill any of them because um when you do it makes the other ones a little bit aggravated oh yeah that does imply the hive mind yeah like they become more aggressive if you kill one and it's like how do they know that you killed one <laughs> it is interesting yeah yeah. There's a lot of weird stuff like that. And then also, but it is very different from the ones in the book. The ones in the book are just slow, regular. Yeah. Regular and zombies. Also, they can detect if somebody has a um has a has a, a fatal disease, a chronic mm. illness. Um and that's I mean, spoiler alert, that's that's how they that's how they end the movie is they um they give everybody meningitis, I think. Well, they give them like a vaccine that has like, the signatures of meningitis, which makes the zombies not interested in eating them. Well, they give them meningitis and then they give them the vaccine for meningitis. I don't remember if that's quite right. Something like that. Well, <laughs> we don't claim anyways, accuracy on this podcast. Yeah. And uh, I mean, and and at that point, I I feel like it it comes dangerously close to breaking like a a, a zombie movie rule. Um, these are these are gentlemen's agreements. These aren't hard written rules, but typically, if you want to have a good movie, like don't make the movie about trying to solve the zombie problem. Like the idea of the zombies is that they can't be stopped. So most most of the best um, movies are just about trying to adapt to the world with the zombies in it. But this movie was very much about like humans versus zombies. The zombies were the bad guys. There's no mm-hmm. there's no other. There's no other arc. There's no other bad guys. It's just we have to stop the zombies. Well, the uncaring, unfeeling. uh, Is it the UN people that don't give a shit about his family? I guess they're kind of bad. Well, I think they're I think I think they're just they're put in a position where they need to have personnel that know what they're doing to fight the zombies. And if uh, if Brad Pitt goes missing and they think that he's dead there's no reason to have his family on the ship anymore they're just taking up space on an already crowded ship still so they, so they sent him away 
Yeah. Sent him to Nova Scotia. Fate worse than death. <laughs> That's where my sister lives. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry your sister lives in Nova Scotia. Speaking <laughs> of another person that will never listen to this podcast. <laughs> um, mostly because I won't tell my family it's happening. So I... For the movie specifically, I feel like we really need to talk about the racism and misogyny of the Living Dead yeah. from World War Z. You know, I got to admit that um, for the for the most part, I this is something that I've never thought about in this movie, and um, like in the in the past. But now that I've now that I'm like looking at it with like differently tuned eyes, uh, I see it differently now. Yeah, feminism ruins everything. Yeah. <laughs> Anti-racism. <laughs> you can't unsee it. Once you like start to see it, you can't unsee it. So the first thing that like bothered me um was it's actually thing that bothers me in general that our society does. So you know how back in the day, I think it was only a couple of years ago they started naming hurricanes after men, men's names. Yeah. All hurricanes were female names. And it was the same thing. Like when the one doctor was talking or the virologist was talking about um the zombie virus he's like you know it's like a female serial killer first of all how many female serial killers are there we all know the serial killer is a cis white dude yeah so (laughs) why are we like why is the female why is the virus female nurse Uh, ratchet leah (laughs) i'm not saying there aren't any i'm just saying there's a (laughs) there's a clear trend for who loves to chop bodies up yeah i mean we've also listened to uh various true crime podcasts and like yeah, it's it's true. Like I'd say, ninety nine out of a hundred are are white men, <laughs> and then yeah. and then there's usually like one white woman who's just who like it's it's usually a little bit more complex than the white men who are just like I'm mean on the inside and I want to hurt people. And <laughs> usually the uh, the woman serial killer is like I've been abused my whole life and now I'm damaged and I want to do the same thing to other people. <laughs> yeah, it's a really strange narrative. But in these movies, so often it's like white dudes are the heroes. Um, women are like props to save or fuck. Um, in this case, there's not a lot of fucking or any fucking in this movie. Yeah, I'll give it that. None, as but, far as I know. <laughs> uh gonna gonna apply the Bechdel test. Dan, what do you think about this movie for the Bechdel test? First of all, the, the Bechdel passive. test, um, for anybody who doesn't know, it's uh it's a test um to it's a test for feminism or a lack of feminism in a movie. <laughs> uh, so what are, what are the conditions of the Bechdel test? Basically two women need to speak to each other in the movie and not about another man, not about a man, about something completely different. Yeah. Their own, their own shit. Yeah. To each other. Um, so yeah, n- never in the movie does one woman speak to another woman in this movie. Not once. Um, it's, and I think this is why I didn't notice it in previous previous viewings is because there is a strong female character um who who isn't like a like a like a a sexual conquest. They're not they're not like sexualizing this character. I forget her name. Sagan. You mean Sagan, Sagan the Israeli yeah. soldier? Yeah, the Israeli soldier yeah. Sagan. Um and you know, and she's tough. So like, I it didn't click in my head that this movie didn't have a whole lot of female characters because like, well, it has Sagan. Sagan's in it, and yeah, you get one his wife. character, <laughs> of course, and two daughters, and one woman in Wales who we don't even know her name. <laughs> <laughs> but I was reading about this. I've got to give a shout out to uh, Dr. Andrew Joseph Pagoda, um, who points out a really good point, which is that. While there are a few female characters that do um, participate in conversation with Brad Pitt, Brad Pitt is always the one who asks the questions and he's always in a position of saving or solving things for women. Women are like, they're there. And I agree, Sagan is the strongest female character, but they're really there to save or solve for, um, which is annoying. And I think it's fair to not notice it right away. I didn't notice it the first time I watched the movie at all. Although I think my feminist lens has certainly sharpened since then. But when you watch these things the first time around, I'm just kind of like blown away by the anxiety of, I don't know, millions of zombies climbing a five foot wall and then murdering everybody in their path. It's like very adrenaline inducing. So it takes a minute to be like, wait a second, this is not actually um, a very balanced movie at all. And I, I, I would argue that there is one scene where Sagan is saving Brad Pitt after the plane crash because oh, right. uh, she she basically carries him all the way to uh, to the to the lab. Uh, but that's it. Other than that, that's it. Yeah. 
And Brad Pitt's wife, I don't even know what her name is as an actress, which just tells you a lot too. Yeah. But I've seen her in other films and so she's familiar. a really great actor. And I, I did notice that almost immediately. I was like this, like, this is an incredible person to cast for a role and then have them say almost nothing other than Brad, don't talk about zombies in front of the children. Like that's one of her longest lines. Basically, she doesn't say exactly like that. But when they're on the ship, she's like, don't. Don't disturb the children. <laughs> it's also an exceedingly white film. I love that this Dr. Pagoda says that it's a mighty whitey film, which I'm going to keep <laughs> forever more. Yeah. Mighty whitey. Um, and I hadn't thought about it before we recorded, but now just thinking about like the fact that they never actually touched on the Israel-Palestinian conflict is definitely like, I think that there are some pro-Israeli overtones and definitely pro-colonialism, imperialism overtones because um, anytime there were any scenes of like the African continent, it was all of these white nations saving Africans from the virus. It very yeah. much like kept that same uh, mentality of like the job of white people is to save black people when really what we're doing is conquering them. Yeah. I mean, and also the same thing in, in when they went to Korea, like it was just, it's like, I'm in Korea and it's a bunch of white people. <laughs> yeah. But it's okay. Cause Brad Pitch saves the, uh, latino child he does in the yeah. very beginning so that makes all of this okay it means brad's a nice white guy nice yeah. white and guy he, and he offers for the family to come on the helicopter but they turn him down um but like again that's that's the whole mighty whitey part of it is that uh brad pitt had to it's, it's all about brad pitt saving everyone you know? yeah it's a very pro-america pro-israeli pro white dude kind of movie white yeah. dudes save the Most world movies are <laughs> They are. I just like can't wait to actually talk good things about The Walking Dead for the ways that it does not perpetuate this stuff. And hopefully yeah. we will watch some other movies that don't. Please, Dan, tell me there's some that are coming. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> oh. I mean, that's the thing is that that's this is pretty much how movies have gone for like the last um, a hundred years. So, uh, you know, and, and it's hard. It's hard to especially since this was made in like 2012 um you know it's just like it's a, it, it's it's something that i i feel like a lot of conservatives um make the argument of is just like like why do, do you have to do you, do you have to put somebody who's not white in a movie um yes. for, it, for it to be okay and it's like yeah i you know i know that the movie is about brad pitt um but like they could have just they could have done more they could have just represented the world a little bit better yeah. that's the thing is that it's just such a white man lens and yeah. i will say to all the writers that are listening um you know lots of great white dudes in the world i'm not gonna say the not all white men thing here but i am <laughs> gonna say if you're writing about zombies just you know just check your own stuff and say like you know is there are there two women who talk to each other and not about a man yeah. in my in my stuff and if there isn't maybe Maybe it's worth, I don't know, <laughs> considering that. Also, without descriptions of their heaving breasts would yeah. be a personal request of mine. Uh, you know, I, I find, you know, that's that's a challenge I found because I I don't know if you know this, Leah. I'm a, a straight white man. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> I do, I'm aware. Um, and, you know, they, they tell you when you're writing, uh, uh, write what you know. And I know about being a straight white man. More than anything else. <laughs> You're an expert, some might say. Yes. Yeah. And it's hard because like I've I don't I don't want to send the 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 message to people that being a straight white man is the best thing to be. <laughs> but it's also what I know. And I I don't want to shoehorn things in. Um I think I think I'm I'm getting there, but it is difficult. Yeah, like I got when I got to read some of your stuff, I'm not going to spoil any of Dan's book, but there is a, a really interesting female character in it. And I really appreciated, Dan, that you were like, read this because I just want to make sure that I'm not Butchering fucking it. this up. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that that really helps. And it's I will say that because of movies like World War Z and pretty much everything else for the majority of um, popular media in the United States and probably most of the world where it's been run by white people is like this is the lens that you're used to seeing and so it's really easy to be invisible and I I hear that it could be challenging to uh 
think about how to incorporate other voices and perspectives when you don't really know them well. And that is a hard line to figure out. But I think that if people really try, it's possible um, to do that like respectfully. But also I think that getting other perspectives is key to doing it well. Yeah. Instead of like your imagining of what a woman's brain is like, or your imagining of what a black person's brain is like, that's where it gets problematic. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's uh sexist and racist. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, it's not like, it's not overt. It's not like they're trying to spread the message of white people are the best. Everybody else is terrible. It's just a product of its time. And that time recently, I feel like has changed a bit. A little bit. I mean, most most white supremacy and like patriarchy perpetuating perpetuating things are not overt, especially if you are a white man, like you pointed out. I mean, it is now. not things you would have noticed. <laughs> I mean, well, some people are very overt, yes. But I think like something I've realized is that specifically, like I obviously I'm gonna notice things that are sexist because I'm a woman. And I have like started to unpack a lot of that myself but it is harder to see racist things because i was raised to think that whiteness is the default so it takes a lot of training and like rethinking things when that is your point of view but i i bet you that like your average person who's not white watching world war z would be like wait a second <laughs> what's going on here i'm gonna throw that out there i think it's also about who's watching it yeah so um moving on this movie has some good zombie survival tips you know, written by the guy who made the zombie survival guide, I would expect it to. <laughs> uh, so the thing that I thought was a very interesting thing that no other zombie movies really done is the idea of protecting your arms and legs from zombie bites. And in the very yeah. beginning in Newark, Brad Pitt duct tapes magazines to his arms and legs. I don't think he does the same for his family, though. <laughs> That's a really good point. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're just not. I, I don't, that's quite an oversight. Yeah. Yeah. And it comes in handy because like a he's, he's slamming a door shut and a zombie smashes its head through the window of the door and uh, and bites right down on that magazine. And it worked. Um, one thing I, I, I hate about zombie movies, you'll see somebody that's like wearing a, like a thick leather jacket and a zombie will bite them in the arm. And it's. And, and they're through. like, oh, I'm bitten. And it's like that that was a leather jacket, dude. I don't I don't know if they have the the biting force to be able to bite through that. <laughs> In general, like humans' teeth are um, I hate to break it to people who love meat. They are designed to eat vegetables and plants, <laughs> yeah. and they're not really good at biting. There's always been a thing I've had with zombies. I'm like, this is just whether it's leather or like through jeans, also, like any yeah. kind of thicker material, they're not gonna get a good hold. Yeah, they might it's get not. a good pinch. They might break the skin yeah. on the inside of the pants, but like denim's tough. Like there, there's a reason that people that do hard work in this world wear jeans. Yeah, and also like there's sometimes there's zombie bites on body parts that I'm just like, there's no way. Like I like think the ribs. Like, like yeah, ribs <laughs> or like the back of the shoulder. I'm like, how? Like think about that. Try and open your mouth and actually like grab someone's shoulder blade. Oh, We're just yeah. not designed yeah. to do that very well. They, well, it's it's convenient placing so they can hide it. Yes, that's why they do it for the reveal. You know what? But if, I do... I, if I got bitten on the shoulder blade, I'd be embarrassed that I would also hide it. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be like, how did this happen? Yeah, like, how does that happen? Like, I can see the top of the shoulder, maybe if you're like snuck up on, but the middle of the shoulder blade, a little weird. But regardless, magazines taped arms and legs is a good one. We should, but the problem is that's also very of its time. Like, do you and I have a single magazine in our house? <laughs> um, well, we we have a lot of recycling. And uh, there's probably <laughs> magazines in our recycling because yeah, we get we sent like, like Vermont Life oh God, magazine or something. That's true. Maybe we should start stocking up as part of our prepper pile. <laughs> Rural living periodically. Yeah. My L.L. Bean catalog that randomly somehow comes to my house, even though I don't order anything from L.L. Bean. Yeah. That is an interesting thing to think about when thinking about the uh, the zombie apocalypse now. Like if you wanted to do the same thing. Would you be able to find magazines to duct tape to your arms? <laughs> this is slightly off topic, but I just had a moment of revelation, like, because also phone books would have been useful for this. Mm, I think and I'm remembering be, that like, too thick to like, you to could like duct tape on. You could probably rip them in half. Well, I'm thinking like a Woodville sized phone book. Yeah. You got to believe oh, that yeah, like in my hometown. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, smaller it's next one. to but Beaverton. Shh. 
<laughs> not like we live there anymore, but this is getting too close to home. Uh, <laughs> but they have people's addresses on them. Like, can you imagine your address just being out there? Now yeah. you have to at least spend 80 bucks to get somebody's address. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, what a trusting world it was back then. Yeah. Well, you know, back then you couldn't just add everybody's phone numbers and addresses and email addresses and their yeah, cell phone numbers phone and their alternative email addresses to a mailing list and sell it on the dark web uh, to a, a an information broker who would then sell a giant list of all of your information attached to your credit card information and your social security numbers to a hacker in Russia who would then use it to... Uh, to spam one cent purchases in San Francisco at a gas station that's made up. Okay. It was a, diff it's a different time. <laughs> it was more depressing than a zombie apocalypse. Let's go back to World War Z and surviving that instead of like, how many times have our cards been uh, stolen this year? I don't even remember, but we've had uh, our, last year, our like, credit cards hacked. Stolen like four times. Yeah, it was brutal. So so back to the world of zombies, which is a much nicer one. Pick a I good really weapon. Liked Oh, I was going to do nine out of 10 rule. Oh, well, let's do the weapon first. Because okay. um, I wanted to talk about the same scene with the magazines. Um, Brad Pitt also duct tapes a kitchen knife to the end of his his hunting rifle, um, which it's, ah, I struggle to say it's not a terrible idea. It is a terrible idea because duct tape isn't going to hold it on there. It's going to pop off. It's probably going, as soon as you try to stab a zombie with it, the duct tape's going to rip. And the knife will probably bounce back at you and cut you. Oh, shit. That's bad. <laughs> also, it was a really cheap knife. So, like, that blade probably would bend if you tried to stab somebody with it. Good to know, because I absolutely would have taped uh, a knife to the end yeah. of the rifle that we have here. The other one that I thought was sort of problematic was Sagan. So, Sagan gets her. So, Brad, I don't remember what his name is, Jerry or something like that in the movie. Let's just call him Bradley. Cuts off. So, her hand gets bitten and he cuts off her hand. Yeah. And then when they're going into the um, the part of the building in Wales that has all of the deadly diseases that they want, she picks a baseball bat for her weapon. And I'm literally just like, you need two hands for a baseball bat. Yeah. I just don't know how that was a, like an oversight. You can't. Can you imagine using a baseball bat with one hand? Um, well, I could. Yeah, you um, could. That's true. But yeah, like it's a baseball bat is a two handed weapon, but. Also, there's not very many good one-handed weapons that would be good for, like, splattering somebody's skull open. No, like, I feel like an actual kitchen knife would be better because you can, like, stab. I jab. just don't think a kitchen knife is a good <laughs> choice. You know, if I mean, if she had a choice, a hatchet or a hammer. Yeah, a hammer would be good. That feels swingable with a single arm. I think the key here is pick a good weapon and pick a good, pick a good weapon for your strengths and weaknesses. Like, yeah. if you're missing a hand, probably don't go with the baseball bat. Just yeah saying. yeah um let's talk about the nine out of ten rule so again yeah. slightly sexist the, the the rule is coming from israel which is why they built the wall um it's a good rule i just don't like how they explained it basically they the, said the that, tenth like, man yeah if they're evaluating a, a potential risk if nine out of ten men in the room disagree that there is no risk it's the tenth man's responsibility <laughs> to prepare for that risk and i uh don't like there's only men in the room making the choice but i do think that that's not the worst idea of like if a majority of people think that there is no risk having one person responsibility to, to presume that there might be one and actually repair is not a bad concept yeah so that Love means it. that we should prepare for aliens landing maybe there already are people <laughs> yeah there are <laughs> i guess we do a space force now so yeah somebody, I mean... somebody decided it was worth funding yeah, there's there are people who do that. There's also people who do it that aren't paid to. <laughs> so <laughs> like uh people who are just alien enthusiasts. Yeah. Well, you know what? Thank you, alien enthusiasts. Somebody's got them. Somebody's got to be prepared. Thank them so soon. We don't know <laughs> what their plans are. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Um zombie survival tip. Um don't sing. No. Don't no singing in the zombie apocalypse. Just no don't. yelling either. No yeah. loud noises. In the army, we would call that light and noise discipline. Mm -hmm. Um it's 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 stressed very much when you're out in the field. Uh the idea is uh you know, flashlights, lanterns, anything that could 
potentially give you away that's that's light discipline making any types of noise is noise discipline and you your discipline is to minimize those as much as possible yeah so don't sing on loudspeakers don't have maybe don't millions have of people yeah. hundreds of thousands of people sing yeah and then put it on a loudspeaker yeah the loudspeaker seemed like overkill at that point like they've got hundreds of people singing this yeah. song and then somebody's like i want to be louder <laughs> i will say though that like the first the first time i watched the movie that did terrify me i yeah. was like what are you doing and then when you start to see the ant compiling of all of the zombies it's very scary uh, i guess they just thought that didn't think that that would happen um and, if, and where we was saw, the nine of ten rule then yeah we where saw was... we saw the trailers so we knew what was coming we knew that there was going to be zombie su to, uh, tsunamis pushing over buses and crawling up walls and grabbing onto helicopters and taking them down and all kinds of crazy stuff. So we knew it was coming. They didn't know it was coming. They're just like, they're zombies. They're fucking stupid. They'll yeah, they were out there these celebrating. Walls, imp impervious. <laughs> it's silly. And then it's like, I think the other one that comes with that is the whole old adage of don't count your chickens before they hatch. Don't celebrate too soon. When you're fucking surrounded by zombies in every direction, that is not the time to be celebrating. Yeah. You have not won. It's not over. Don't yeah. do it. And our last zombie survival tip uh, is uh, inject yourself with a deadly disease. Any of them. Yeah. That was wild. He literally just picked a random vial. Yeah. <laughs> and then they're up. watching on the on the screen. They're like, not that one. <laughs> <laughs> and he just he just happened to pick one that wasn't so deadly, I guess. I don't. Yeah, I think it was totally a, a Russian roulette moment. Yeah, where he really didn't know. What <laughs> didn't he, was he read doing. the labels? Like, I don't. I mean, I got to imagine that. Like, even though I don't know what the Latin um, naming convention is for viruses, it's got to be somewhat close. You know, you'd be able to look at something and it's like, it's like, yeah, this one's meningitis. I think. I don't know, but even if you did know that, would you know it's a good one or not? I wouldn't. I just he like, literally just bad. held them in his hands, like <laughs> uh, I don't know. I'll pick this one. <laughs> yeah. Well, and then there was also like he waited. I don't know how long he waited. How do you know how long it takes for your body to have enough that a zombie won't know that you are? I don't know. I'm not even I sure know. I fully buy into the premise that that's how it. Which is why I think like that. That's how it works. Which is why I agree with you, Dan, that they shouldn't try and solve the the zombie virus because. I don't, zombies are dead by their definition. So why the fuck do they care if you have meningitis? Is it because they think that like. Well, they're suggesting that the wasn't... virus itself is intelligent and it doesn't, it doesn't want to have to compete for the host. Yeah. But wouldn't meningitis, the virus die with the host, but then the zombie virus would take over. I, I just know. think but I'm not I guess, convinced. I guess if that, if that zombie then uh, bit somebody else. Um, what would they that, get? That virus strain could be then mutated because it's combined with other deadly pathogens. Mm, interesting. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it's you know what? It's a it's it is a um, viral supremacist virus. <laughs> it wants a pure strain. A pure what? host. Yeah, it wants uh, a pure host for the purity of their strain. Yeah, sounds very <laughs> accurate for this movie overall. In Damn, which case, I, I feel like. So many more people should have been not infected by zombies because if you go out into the world, um, like nine out of 10 people are half dead that you talk to. Oh. They're like, <laughs> like, it's like, you just go ask somebody on the street, like, what do you got? What's wrong with you? And they'll <laughs> I mean, be like, ah, oh, don't get me started. <laughs> the bacteria. That's true. But I guess it's like, it has to be a really bad one. It's interesting. Yeah, I so. um, I have a question for you, Dan. Yes. We haven't had a chance to do this this particular segment in a while. I want to know if you anything from the movie bothered you that you think you could have done better than how it was solved for in the movie. You know, I mean, the biggest thing is I don't really like the whole using a virus to disguise yourself from the zombies. Mm. I I kind of wish that this was more um in the in in the way of like how the book did things. It wasn't about defeating the zombie virus it was about outlasting the zombies and fighting them in a conventional war um, yeah so like i would have i would have changed that ending but also like there were some missed opportunities like a fan favorite part of the book uh is a chapter about the battle for yonkers and 
this was a huge military campaign in Yonkers uh, that was set up by the military, um, mostly as a camera opportunity. Like they wanted to show off their military power. It was mm. kind of a statement about the military at that time, <laughs> just like all flash and show. But anyways, uh, they they did it. They fought conventionally against zombies in Yonkers. And it was all these, they, they used barrages of explosions, all of these high tech weapons like Abrams tanks, fighting positions, um, guided missiles and stuff. And what they realized is that all of these explosions and conventional weapons against walking corpses um, didn't really wipe them out. Like, you know, 75% of them were destroyed, but the rest of them were now like dragging themselves on the ground, almost more dangerous because they're That's on the horrifying. ground crawling. Ugh. And, uh, and these bombs, like when it, when you send out shrapnel in every direction, these aren't headshots. They're blowing off limbs, going through torsos and stuff. Um, and conventional warfare is about, it's about defeating, defeating the morale of your enemy, making them give up. Like, Hmm. giving them no more hope that they can win so that they retreat and give up. And that's when you win a war is when, is when their morale is depleted and zombies are not susceptible to morale victories. They don't care. They just keep coming. They're not afraid of you. They're, they just, they just want to eat you and that's it. And in the battle for Yonkers, it, tur- it that turned the tide of that battle because people started seeing that not only were they not afraid of the bombs being thrown at them, but uh, but their own the their own soldiers on the front line were being affected by the fact that their attacks did not affect the hordes of zombies, mm. and it worked in reverse and it kind of pushed them back, um, and that that story was like a fan favorite that everybody will talk about. uh, If you go to Reddit and like read anything about world war Z uh, that's the thing that comes up the most. And they could have put that in the, in the, in the movie to show like how, like that could have been a really like a huge scene. Like that could have been in the trailer, you know? (laughs) Yeah. And, um, and they didn't, they didn't do that. And I feel like if, if they did, it could have, it could have just been even like even more impactful as a film. So before we get into the film a little bit more, I'm curious how many Zeds you would give World War Z. I honestly uh, don't know. Five. Um, because I like I would like to rank it highly because it is most people would agree it's a really great zombie movie. Um, but there's things like the zombies being the bad guy. There's no there's no underlying there's no underlying purpose of the movie other than they're zombies. Oh, they're zombies. We need to fight them. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's a slight subtext of him actually caring about his family, but it was very shallowly done. Yeah, because nobody nobody cares about their family in <laughs> other movies. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty pretty one-dimensional movie. Yeah. I would agree. But but the action scenes were really good. And genuinely, the first time I saw it, I, I also saw it in theaters. Like, my adrenaline was high pretty much the entire time. So I will give it credit for that. Yeah, you know, I'm I'm going to base this on whether or not if you took all the zombies out of the movie, would it still be a good movie? Mm. And I don't think it would be a good movie if there was no zombies in it. I think no. it'd be a movie about flying places <laughs> and then a movie about a plane crash uh-huh. and then a movie about being in a lab. So how many <laughs> Zeds does that give it? Not very many. Yeah, One? I'm gonna, I'll give it. Honestly, I'll give, I'll give it three stars because the acting was good. And uh, with the zombies in it, it was good. Three out of five Zeds. Got yeah, it. I will five. give it a two. All two right. out of five Zeds. Fair. I probably should have given it two, but yeah. I'm I'm more generous you with my are. stars. <laughs> As demonstrated by me winning the Amazon $100 challenge. <laughs> you're much more generous. Spoiler alert. If, uh, <laughs> well, if you haven't listened. Yeah, you're not listening in order? Terrible. Um. <laughs> But yeah, let's talk about the book, which I this is my spoiler for the book. Infinitely fucking better than the movie. And I hate that that's so stereotypical. But in this case, it is absolutely true. Yeah. Book exceptionally better. So the book isn't about one specific person. It's um, it's a it's God, what, what would Josh say it is? It's not an anthology. 
No, because that would require multiple multiple it's writers. A, it's a novel. It's a novel, but it's a novel that's written. It's like almost like um it's like 20 or 30 short stories about the zombie apocalypse. And it yeah. starts off a collection. Like, a collection of stories. Yeah, it's it starts off uh knowing that we have already won the war against the zombies. And the uh, there's somebody the the main character is the person that's going around and interviewing survivors of the zombie apocalypse. Um and he is going from the very beginning, like the first the first instances of the outbreak, trying to find people that uh that were there for the beginning. And then trying to piece together a cohesive narrative all the way to the end where they are now, like yeah. where it started, what happened when the outbreak happened, um, turning the tides, defeating the zombies. And then it continues on after into like how we're rebuilding the world after the war. And even then they're still like cleaning zombies out of the ocean. There's still like millions and millions of zombies just walking around at the bottom of the ocean. That's and, horrifying like, to think about. Frozen in the Arctic and various places where like not, people don't normally go. So they're, like they're going out to these places to try to like get rid of them. Yeah. Um, it's um, and it's definitely a book. Unlike the movie that I think if there weren't, zombies there would still be really interesting human stories yeah in there interesting characters with something to say what was your favorite uh story from the book Dan? um i'm gonna go i'm gonna go with two stories uh the battle for yonkers because it's it's just it's action and it's excitement and this book kind of like reads as like a documentary so like having the battle for yonkers in there like helps you like feel the action and intensity of the zombie mm. apocalypse. Whereas many other of the chapters are just like, like, yeah, I rebuilt a town in Montana. And now that's where I live with my husband. <laughs> I like those ones though. Yeah. I mean, they all, they all tell a story, you know? And um, so that one's, that one's good on its own. Like you could read the battle for Yonkers and you could just, you could just be like, yeah, that was uh that was an awesome zombie story. Um, the other one that I like was it took place in the sewers of Paris. Oh, um, like because Par Paris has all of those underground tombs and people went underground during the the zombie apocalypse and they stayed under there for a really long time. And it was all about these people like kind of just like um, going out on patrol in the dark in the sewers, trying to take out zombies that had you know, like started to come into the sewers after them mm. and it's about them just kind of like walking around in the dark and being terrified that's horrifying i yeah. i don't remember that one full disclosure i did not reread the entire book but we did listen to some stories um during our our own three-day power outage yeah, trial run true. of the apocalypse yeah. uh dan's phone but oh, uh, so long ago <laughs> yeah i think it's really interesting because you like the ones where there is a lot of suspense but for me, the story that really stands out for me that I remember is the one of the doctor who um, was part of the underground body part selling yeah. movement. Who and this was that. at the beginning where they're telling the origins. Yeah. And in this case, one of the origins was the story. Yeah. Or one of the potential origins. I think like it's clear that they don't actually know, but this doctor thinks like, or no, they do know because of the guy with the eyeball, right? Do you remember the details? I not a whole not. lot. He's so he's a doctor, and they're getting black market organs from China, and um, and he's working like uh, I don't even know in in South America somewhere because he's uh, he's not he's not the most legitimate doctor in America. So he's he's gone down to Central and South America to do black market organ trans transplants, and um, one of the organs had the virus in it and because it's because it's an organ it's put on ice like it lays dormant inside the organ for a while and slowly infects the person as as they've received the implant it's pretty wild yeah <laughs> i really like that story because it i again like with even without zombies there's something really interesting going on there and it reminds me of actually like it's not that far off from what humans do to each other already i'm sure that that stuff actually does happen one and two i don't know if dan have you ever seen the body worlds exhibit or the bodies exhibit or heard is, about it uh, is this in south korea 
No, it's a go. It travels all over. So Body Worlds was the original one, and it's um, donated cadavers that are uh, put into all kinds of positions, or like different parts of them are on display. So you could have like a body that's just um, the veins and the heart, all of the wow. that part of you, or you could have one that's just the organs that they're preserved and they're in like doing all kinds of things. They're doing like dancer moves, sports <laughs> moves. There's some, there's like, sometimes there's like a camel or another animal and it's really interesting. It's a really interesting way to learn about the body. It's also a little creepy. Um, that's the original one is body worlds, which all of those uh, bodies are obtained. And I think an ethical way, which is like, you can donate your body to body worlds, oh. but then there's bodies, which don't go to bodies because you want to guess where they get their cadavers from. Uh, Take a wild guess. Um, I'm going to say Orlando. <laughs> no, I wasn't exactly. Why Orlando? That's not, that's not correct. Um, it's, near, it's near where uh, Tragic lives. <laughs> Shout out and, to Tragic. Yeah, tragic, he's, he, said, the... he said it's a pretty sketchy neighborhood down oh, there where he lives. I mean, so. maybe that's partly where they're channeled from, but no, they're all, um, they're all cadavers from the Chinese government that donates them oh. to this because they're people who at the time of death had no close next of kin or immediate family members so they're not claimed so a lot of them are probably prisoners to be frank mm. um or foreign prisoners which i don't know about you but that doesn't really feel i know you're dead but i still think you have a, should have a right to decide what happens to your body and what's even more creepy about it speaking of racism is that like they'll make them look like white people so they'll put blue <laughs> fake blue eyes in them and like just oh, wow. weird yeah weird shit like that so Go to body worlds. Don't go to bodies. But my point is, is that like that, those are the kinds of stories from the book that felt like some of the real unsee or unseemly seedy parts of human nature that could cause an apocalypse. Yeah. <laughs> There's also this story about um somebody who was like a pharma bro. And uh, while the outbreak was happening, they were pushing this um, drug that their pharmaceutical company was developing as a cure even though it didn't actually do anything. And it really reminded me of the whole like hydroxychloroquine uh, <laughs> situation during COVID or, um, or the uh, horse dewormer. Ivermectin. <laughs> Ivermectin. <laughs> oh, humanity. Do you remember, were, were you with me when I went into the tractor supply company, which is like a yeah. store for those who don't know. And like all of the Ivermectin, so I actually needed to deworm my horse. That's the thing you've got to do a few times a year. And uh, they were off the shelves and there were signs that said, this is not for human consumption. If you need it, go to the cashier and they'll get it for you. Yeah. Like literally they had to take it off the shelves of South Carolina. So many people <laughs> were coming in and buying it. Yeah. And this was like, it was, it wasn't until like a year later that we started to hear stuff like that in the news. Like this was at the very beginning. Early days. This was before we were wearing face masks and oh my gosh, that's right. People were eating fucking horse paste. <laughs> <laughs> And I remember seeing it and we laughed so hard. We were just like, who would, who would think that that would do anything? I mean, ivermectin does have some uses for people, but it should be prescribed yeah. by a doctor one. And two, the ones that are at the horse store are like the, the weight options. I think the lowest weight is 500 pounds yeah. or 300 pounds, something like that. Like not, I would not know what the accurate amount is for a 150 pound person. For example. Yeah, but if you were a 500 pound person, then you'd You're be great. set. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, I guess. <laughs> Just squirt it right in your mouth. <laughs> Make an iver ivermectin s'more. Yeah. What's another story that you love, Dan, and why? Mm. You know, at the very end of the book, I, I, I don't, I struggle to say that I love this story, but uh, it was, it's, it's in the part of the book where they're talking about like rebuilding the world. And there's a story of a Russian woman who's part of a, like a birth farm in Russia, where basically she's like, as soon as they give birth to a baby, they're, they're inoculated again. And they're just like producing baby after baby in these, in these farms and, uh, and then being milked. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't sound at all like how we treat dairy cows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean uh you know there's a little bit of a wink and a nod in there i'm sure <laughs> but uh yeah that was uh that was a pretty fucked up story and uh it stuck with me many of the stories i don't recall um there was also this story about uh this is during the outbreak it's a bunch of rich people um like super rich people who 
all invested in this fortified mansion, basically high walls. They hired private security and there's like all these reality TV show stars that come with like their entourages. The place is stocked so that like there's enough there's enough food in this place to feed an army for years is how it's described. And it's all from the point of view of this private security guy. Um, And this story is actually probably the only reason I know that they don't have running zombies in this book, because they're watching the security cameras and some of their motion sensors go off and they realize that there's a horde running towards them. They're like, they're like, Oh shit. Can zombies run? This is bad. This is really bad. Cause if they can run, they can climb. Um, And then uh, what they realize is because they've been broadcasting all of their drama from inside this place on TV and on the, on the internet, like basically turning it into a reality TV show with all of your favorite reality TV stars. Um, People are like, it's safe there. Let's all go there. (laughs) (laughs) And everybody, it's all survivors trying to get in. And, uh, and, and the, um, and the private security is ordered to fire on them. And they're like, "Uh, no, we're going to, we're going to (laughs) split. We're out of (laughs) here. And all the private security takes off and leaves and basically uh, the uh, the people who break in basically eat the rich. I like that. Yeah. So it has a happy <laughs> a ending. ending. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Maybe we should think about doing. Um, well, I'd love to hear from folks what they think their favorite story was. If you read the book, even if it was a while ago, which one sort of stuck with you? Um, and would it still be good without zombies? Because that's always the test. Yeah. Is the, so yeah. Would the book be good without the zombies in it? Yeah. W- well, would the story? I think depending <laughs> yeah. on the story, like would the Battle of Yonkers be good without zombies? I don't think I so. Guess not. You know, I guess I guess the whole book would not be that very interesting without the zombies in it. <laughs> no, except for the body or not body snatching. The body parts thing was interesting yeah. to me. But even um, then, it all it all it came from it all ended in zombies, which I guess is fine. I mean, it it was just that one was just a story about like illegal organ trade, and there yeah. just happened to be some karma at the end that they turned into a zombie. And that doctor was an asshole. It's yeah, really interesting. An yeah. Um, and I can't, you know, I I was reading a little bit, but I can't remember well enough to decide if it like if the book um would have would have had a feminist lens or would have been really white centered. So again, if you've read it recently and you have thoughts about that, let me know. But what do you think, Dan? It's hard to say. Um, there are a lot of characters who are not American and not white and not male. Um, there we go. So there is a wide variety of those. I think it's I think it's written with like definitely with a Western lens. But um, one of one of the early stories is uh, one of the first doctors to ever um, make contact with a zombie uh, who's Chinese, and he tells a whole story about basically this town in China and the history of that town in China. And then uh, what it's like being a doctor in China and then going on this call and the the person that he would call for advice and how that person was. So, yeah, I don't know. It's hard to say. I I think, I think that the, that Max Brooks put himself in a lot of people's different shoes for this. Yeah, I think that's also why it's so much better than the movie, because it really does have a lot of different perspectives. And it's also just a really unique take. One, that the zombie apocalypse ends at all, and humans recover to the degree that they do. And two, just all the, like, the idea of multiple stories and points of views. So I would definitely give uh, four out of five Zeds for the book. Yeah, that's what I'd, give it. I'd yeah. say four out of five. I don't know what five out of five would be for me. Yeah, me either. I haven't read it yet. But I mean, I read probably it, my like, book, your, your book. Yeah, definitely. Dan's <laughs> book. Five out of five Zeds. I mean, I, actually, it really is really good. But uh, or at least the part that you've let me read so far yeah. is really good. I'm sure some people will uh, disagree with me when it comes out. Yeah, I can't wait to see all the Amazon one star reviews. Yeah, I'm not going to read them. You can read them. <laughs> I'll read them and let you know or yeah. not let you know. Yeah. If just like this podcast, if you have any negative feedback for me, leave it as a five star review. <laughs> And Dan, are there any survival tips we think from? Uh, oh, from the, the book? book? Oh, God, so many. Like the whole book is basically, I mean, they're all stories from people who survived. So do what they did. Yeah. <laughs> Read books. Read books that help you survive. I mean, it does. There's a 
a lot more nuance in a book than this movie. I will say also, somebody who doesn't watch movies a lot anymore because of how much great long form television there yeah. is. It just was a reminder of how much less deep you can get in a movie sized story yeah. than a book or a television series. It de- it's definitely hard for me to enjoy a movie these days when when really I just want long form content. Like we're we're watching Better Call Saul season six now, and it's just so like, good. How would you make a movie out of this? <laughs> <laughs> it would be a real shame. We did get a movie recommendation from a listener. What was it, Dan? Oh, I don't know. I don't have it up. <laughs> I don't have my but phone he, on me. But he said that it's uh, terrible. Really terrible. Great. Can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if, if Leah's going to enjoy a terrible movie. We have a lot of terrible movies we can watch. Uh, Zombie Ass Toilet of the Dead is yeah, on our list. Zombie Ass Toilet of the Dead, a uh, Japanese movie about about pooping zombies i guess i don't know <laughs> i guess we'll find out it's <laughs> we do have an episode coming up called how to poop in the apocalypse so yeah um... yeah if you want to know how to poop in the, po- the apocalypse <laughs> listen to that episode listen to this uh, this, this is the podcast yeah this only is the one that talks you. about that <laughs> um so is there anything else any final words on world war z for yourself please? i think that's it i mean there's so much to talk about with world war z z that, um <laughs> that it's <laughs> You know, I could just talk forever, and I'm trying not to do that these days. <laughs> We're also trying to keep this around an hour, folks. Um, let us know. Do you like the longer episodes, or can you go with an hour? Uh, we are both talkers, so it could go could go a lot further. But we do have a really exciting book for episode 15 um, that I am actually going to read. I'm actually going to listen to it, if I'm honest. I love Audible. Should you um, read it, and I be the one that's in the dark? Asking no, you, you have to listen to it on on Audible too while you're driving. Yeah. So this is I did not know this existed. I forget how we found out about it. Uh, I've known for a long time. <laughs> okay, I did not know it existed because I am the casual zombie lover. Dan is the hardcore zombie yeah. lover. Um, it's called Pride and Prejudice and Zombies by Jane Austen and Seth Graham Smith, which is basically a mashup of Austen's classic novel with a zombie apocalypse, which is why I'm super excited. Yeah. Read it. You know what? The, I mean, I think that this has potential because uh, the question of is it a good book without the zombies, it was already a good book. Then they added zombies. So winning combination. Yeah. Um, and like there's so the reason I'm going to just read this one clip to maybe get some folks interested in reading it with me. So uh, Grant Smith says that the original text of the novel was well suited for use as a zombie horror story. I and mean, again, referring to Jane Austen. Um, or pride and pride and prejudice he says you have this fiercely independent heroine you have this dashing heroic gentleman you have a militia camped out for seemingly no reason whatsoever nearby and people are always walking here and there and taking carriage rides here and there it was just ripe for gore and senseless violence (laughs) from my perspective anyway so i am super into this uh and then i'll read a little bit of the plot to get folks Hopefully their their whistles wetted at the ball. Mr. Bingley and the eldest Bennett daughter, Jane, make a connection in the midst of a chaotic zombie attack. During this time, Elizabeth meets Fitzwilliam Darcy, Mr. Bingley's closest friend. When zombies attack, the Bennett sisters use their martial arts skills to keep the human attendees safe. I am so ready for this book. Love it. <laughs> so ready. Um, and the last time I read this book, Pride and Prejudice was in high school. So I wow. definitely appreciate the incorporation. I've never read it. Wow, good for you. Well, consider my whistle wet, Leah. Mm, I like it. <laughs> um, also, I don't know if you knew this, Leah, but this has also been uh, converted into a movie as well. I saw that, so maybe we'll have to, we'll have to do I've both. Heard again. it's not good. Oh, well, well, we'll <laughs> so, just do the book. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I wouldn't I wouldn't be opposed to watching it, but we got to do it like when we are done with Better Call Saul. I think. That is very true. And to yeah. be frank, I mean, we've got a few episodes, 15 ep- or we've got uh, four more episodes to go before we get to this one. But to be fair, we signed up for a podcast that means watching and reading fucking terrible literature and movies <laughs> it's like true. that. Unfortunately, a lot of the genre is just bad. That's OK. Yeah. All right. Well, there we go, everybody. Um, don't forget to uh, to to give us a rating. Give us a review. Um, I think you can only do reviews on Apple podcasts. Um, but you know what? You could also just give us five stars on Spotify. Majority of people are on Spotify. Weird. I know. <laughs> yeah. And if you found us, how have you found us? We are not yeah. doing any actual promotion and we get a I've lot of people who are like, we love this podcast. And I'm like, how did you discover yeah. it? Is it my dope memes? 
Is that how I you're finding so. us? Damn zombie. Speaking memes. of which, we're on Instagram. If you yes. don't already know. <laughs> <laughs> At Zombie Book Club Podcast. Yeah. Find us. Come say hello. Yeah. And uh, you know, we've uh down in the description, we've got a whole link tree. Um included there is the Instagram, of course. We've also got a Discord. Um, I have listed my Twitter, which I don't really use anymore. Uh and also a couple other things. Uh as as we as we do other things in the social media realm, that uh, link tree will be uh, updated. You can also subscribe to a link tree. I just found this out like not long ago. I did not know that. Yeah, and I can send uh, updates about our link tree updates if you subscribe. <laughs> <laughs> Very exciting. Yeah, Definitely I've subscribe. never done it, but I could. I could if I wanted to. But in um, general, if you want Dan to not um become extremely depressed this summer as he sweats in his, his unair conditioned truck and gets oh, yeah. diesel all over his body a review would really help um definitely we love interaction on instagram and on discord yeah. keep him going friends because he, he's about to actually try and fix our washing machine it's a hard life <laughs> yeah, for Dan. That's what i'm gonna do now <laughs> yeah not only do i not have air conditioning in my truck but it actually blows hot air in my face and every time if you subscribe to this podcast that you're listening to right now, it will turn off the hot air in my truck for five minutes. <laughs> you wish. And I would so appreciate that. I actually do wish that. Yeah. <laughs> but thanks for listening, everybody. We'll uh, we'll see you in the next one. And uh, yeah, have, have a good time. Don't get bit. Don't get bit in a while, crocodiles. But if you do get bit, uh, bite somebody else. <laughs> Tell my dog that. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye.